Thank you once again for joining us, Harry. It's been a pleasure. Ainara, please stay on set. You are not done with us yet. We have already talked about universities, online training, data mining, coding, disruptions, and many other things. But we have barely mentioned vocational training. Some studies conclude that a very high percentage of companies have issues to cover their offer positions. The reason? They cannot find profiles who match their needs. And this is certainly not because of the lack of candidates, but because they don't check every requirement needed for the job. This is known as the gap between education and employment. Quite a paradox, don't you think? How could we explain such a gap? If you want to know how, pay close attention to the upcoming panel. Ainara, the set is yours. Thank you. Welcome to the panel, Reimagine Technical and Vocational Education and Training to Solve for Employment and Inclusion. First of all, let me introduce the three speakers. For me, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Ramona Moshet, is the CEO and founder of Generation, a McKinsey initiative focused on close the gap between youth and unemployment. Uh, Olivier Cruzet is the head of pedagogy of School 42, a very special school without teachers and where all the students work as a team to face all different challenges. And Ricardo Pineda Villa, the CEO and founder of Bansa, an educational company who help uh, to training competences for the future of war. Welcome, three of you, Mona, uh, Oliver and Ricardo. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your projects are examples of other ways of organizing learning and employment and the combination between them and how technology can be used to do so. So to achieve that, what elements characterize each of your projects and what things do you are doing in a different way to generate training and employment experience that are innovative and with real results? Who wants to start? Mona, for example? Happy to. Um, so Generation is a nonprofit and what we do is recruit, train and place learners into careers that would otherwise be beyond their reach. Um, so we started six years ago. We're now in 15, in 14 countries, excuse me. And what we do is a full methodology that goes, that starts with pre-confirming job vacancies in 26 professions across our countries. We then have um, boot camps that are four to 12 weeks long, and it varies by the profession. And what we're doing is supporting our learners to master the activities that they'll need to perform at a high level in their chosen profession. In parallel, we offer social support services. And then once our learners have completed the program, they then interview with our employer partners, and then we continue to support them and to track their progress once they're on the job. And so what we found is that to support those learners that face the most challenge, it is critical to be able to deliver these seven components together so that we can ensure their success. Thank you. Olivier? Well, um, about, for, about 42, it's a school that has been created seven years ago in Paris, France, and now it's uh, uh, 32 campuses all around the world. And uh, uh, the main two big differences that you can find in uh, uh, this uh, ICT training in higher education, uh, at first, it's a very uh, unusual selection process. Uh, we want to detect ICT talent, regardless the school background and regardless the uh, educational uh, background. So it means that the school is completely free for the students and also there is no degree requirement to apply to, uh, to 42 and during the selection process we do have a, a special uh, four weeks long uh, immersion uh, just like a, a boot camp that is called la piscine it's a french word for swimming pool uh, and uh, during these four weeks the students are uh, discovering our uh, second uh, very special point it's our pedagogical model uh, 
In 42, as you already mentioned, there is no teacher, there is no lecture, there is no MOOC, and our students are facing software development challenges. Uh, they need to look for information to filter this information, because online it's very easy to find a lot of obsolete or irrelevant or false information regarding ICT and regarding coding. Our students need to create a piece of software, and to do this, they need to collaborate because uh, during such kind of debate with their neighbors and their friends, they will be able to create some collective uh, intelligence. All our uh, um, curriculum is completely gamified and uh, our students progress at their own pace on their own path. Uh, so uh, it's something that is very unusual regarding the classic uh, academia uh, training that you can find in university or in engineering schools uh, in France. And Ricardo, what do you think is the most characteristic element of your project, Bansa? Well, Anara, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation. I hope I can learn a lot from Mona and, and Olivier. So let me tell you about Bansa. Bansa is a corporate training company focused on blended and virtual training for the future of work. And more than that, we are focused on increasing the productivity of different companies in Latin America and also improving people's life through education. What we do is pretty simple. We have two different services, create and learn. Uh, create, we create on, online educational content. That means educational game, podcasts, educational videos, and so on for, for different companies. And the other one is what we call learn. We offer blended training in the 10 most important soft skills or what we call skills for the future. Uh, through an innovative educational model. What we do is that we measure the, the, the soft skills gap using artificial intelligence. Then the students receive micro learning or short learning capsules every day. So they start like a new habit of learning. We use gamification. So they, they improve and they see the results. And then they, they met with the teacher, with the coach, and they facilitate all the learnings with the different students after that, they apply the learning and we measure the impact. During the last five years, we have been working with more than 300 companies in Latin America. And more important, we have trained 300,000 students. And what is more crucial is that if you invest $1 in training with Banza, you will get $3 in, in return. Thank you. And now we talk about collaboration. Many of the current challenges are organizing around alliances and collaborations. And this is, I think, part of your projects too. So what role do you think uh, have the collaborations and the different agents that are involved in your projects? And what role they have in the success of your projects? For example, Olivier in School 42. Well, collaboration is definitely a key part. Uh, first, in our pedagogical model, inside uh, the school, inside our community, between our own students. As if they don't collaborate, if they do not uh, uh, start projects uh, with a team, if they do not ask questions outside their own team, they will be completely lost and they won't be able to progress inside the curriculum. But of course, we want our students to learn how to collaborate with companies, to learn how to collaborate with uh, students from other uh, kind of schools. Uh, we do have a lot of hackathon conferences and meetup where our students uh, can um, definitely uh, exchange, debate, and work uh, actively uh, on uh, different topics. And uh, we also mix our students with um, students from business school, for example. We are doing this in Paris with HEC, the most famous French business school, but also with art and design school. Uh, this will uh, bring to our students a uh, team that they will meet during their, uh, their job and during their career. They will have to work with such kind of profiles during their, their career. Uh, so definitely collaboration is uh, something that is very, uh, very important for our students. And we try to uh, recreate many kind of situations that they will face during their whole career. Ricardo, and how do you manage the collaboration dimension in, in Bansa? Well, I think partnerships and alliances are crucial. 
But l let me tell you, like, how big is the problem in Latin America so you understand how important are alliances. Half of the companies complain that they don't have the required skills to be more productive. And if you pick 10 students at the age of four, based on the dropout rates, only one of them will end college. And the third fact is that the training budget, which is really low in Latin America, like 1% of their total budget, is to spend 75% on directors and C-level, and only 25% on blue-collar workers, who are the ones who have the, the biggest skills gap. So partnership for us, what we've been doing is we partner with the Association of Human Resources so we can improve the corporate training and, the, and raise awareness of how important it is to train blue-collar workers. And second, we partner with uh, the most important NGO in Colombia, which is Fundación Corona, that is focused on education for work, to understand why people stay more time in their job. And we, we found out really interesting things that we are sharing. So people start improving the, the skills for the base of the pyramid in Latin America. So we need to solve this vicious cycle of low income, low productivity and low education in Latin America through important partnerships. Mona, what's the role of the alliances in generation? Um, so when we designed Generation, it was very much from the spirit of how do we embed our methodology inside institutions that already exist in the education to employment system. So, for example, um, Generation partners with vocational or technical institutions um, in multiple countries across the world, whereby um, we are supporting their instructors um, to teach the Generation program. We also partner with nonprofits to work with us to provide the appropriate mentorship to our learners. Um, and we obviously partner um, with our employers. Uh, so today, Generation works with 3,000 employers um, across the world. Um, we have 75 implementation partners. And in that way, we've been able to now reach 38,500 graduates um, with an 86% job placement rate within three months. Um, and that's only possible because we've been able to literally embed ourselves inside the community infrastructure. So now let's talk about the last part of the title of the, plan, of the panel, the inclusion. And technology is another key element of the three uh, projects, and both in content and in ways you work with the technology. But this crisis, the pandemic, uh, shows uh, especially the limitation of the technologies and makes more visible than ever the digital divide, for example. So how do you manage in your project this project with high technical component, but uh, how you oriented the technology in order to put in service to the inclusion? How do you avoid the digital divide in your project and how can you include the technology but in order to, to include other people and maybe some, some groups of minorities? For example, we are starting with Ricardo now. Well, the, the, the future of education, in my opinion, is the combination of the best element of online and offline education. I don't think we're going to focus only on online learning because for us, the teacher plays a, um, a key role. So what we've been doing with the technology is how can we expand the impact and also how can we improve the teacher experience and the students results? So we do four things make learning fun and easy. We combine different methodologies to make learning fun and also our technology works really effective in, in mobile devices, which is crucial for LATAM uh, workers. Another thing is that education for the future of work so, should focus more on activation instead of motivation. One of the disadvantage of our modern brain and, and the ability to imagine things is that we often spend more time thinking about action than taking action. So technology help us to achieve this to, to, so people can implement all the learnings. And finally, we create new habits with these micro capsules, micro learning, and, and 
we measure the impact of the training so the students in the companies see the results uh, of the education programs that that we have so in conclusion i've just just Bezos said there is no day two every day is day one learning is really really important with action and technology help us to increase that uh, that impact Mona, what's in generation the role of inclusion in, in, in the foundation of the project? Yeah, I mean, so for generation, um, we are founded on how do you break bias barriers and enable inclusion? Um, that's the entire focus of our work in all of our countries. Um, and that happens, um, I'll, I'll just give you two examples. I mean, one is supporting our learners to get into tech careers where typically there is lower representation, um, particularly by people of color, and how do we increase that? It's also about supporting um, more women to enter into tech careers. So for example, um, across our programs globally, for our tech programs, 60% of our uh, learners are female. Um, and that's much higher than typically what, what, what you find in the tech workforce for females. Um, we also um, recently launched a regeneration program which focuses on learners in their 40s and 50s and how we also support them to enter into tech careers when often there can be biases on that front. Um, so that's one side. The other side is just simply how we use data and our own internal tech, if you will, um, to support our learners to be more successful. So uh, we now have 7 million data points across our learners from their socioeconomic profile when they apply to us, to their performance in the boot camp, to their performance on the job. And so now we're able to use predictive analytics to be able to figure out how we can even more proactively support different profiles so that we increase the likelihood of their success. Um, so those are just some of the ways that we bring inclusion to life in generation. And Olivia, uh, in School 42, how do you manage the, the inclusion? How do you ensure that you are not uh, the digital device is a barrier? Well, um, we are acting on several points. Uh, I think that our selection process is wide open. Our general communication is not, if you are sure you want to come and do some ICT training, come to 42, no. We are telling out loud that everyone should try and figure out if it's something that uh, is interesting uh, for, uh, for him or her uh, or not. Uh, so uh, everyone above 18 years old can apply. And the fact that the school is free, the fact that uh, there is uh, no school background uh, asked to, uh, to apply is something that uh, allow to have a higher uh, inclusion uh, on, uh, during our selection process. And for example, more than half of our students never did code before. Uh, I see, um, 42 is an ICT and a coding school, uh, but it's completely suitable for someone who never coded before, who knows someone who was, well, maybe not very far away from uh, digital, but someone who was not deep into digital. Um, also, we do have, uh, just like Mona, some action uh, about um, uh, gender equality. We try to uh, attract more women. In France, uh, it's uh, usually uh, no more than 15% or 20%, and we try to increase also this, uh, this number. Uh, and we also try to have inside our campuses uh, a very uh, um, warm welcome for anyone, uh, whatever the, the difference of uh, each uh, individual. And uh, uh, across our entire network, uh, we also did uh, uh, notice that, for example, uh, from one country to another, there can be a very strong uh, difference uh, regarding access to digital. For example, our two campuses in Morocco, it was very complicated during the pandemic because of low internet access and difficulties to uh, have some um, uh, computers uh, at home. So that's why so far in all our campus, someone who is very far from digital can still progress 
because we do have uh, huge uh, computer rooms and students can uh, just on their own just can just come on campus and have access to computers and to all the hardware needed to progress inside the curriculum. We think that's also something that is right now still interesting uh, to uh, increase inclusion, digital inclusion for uh, many um, people in very poor or difficult situations. The three projects maybe are very attractive for the companies, maybe more than the traditional educational offer. So why do you think your project are so attractive to the companies, to the work uh, environment? Because what, why the, the project staff fits better with the dynamic of the companies, with the way the companies are working? Or what do you think is so attractive the project for the, for the company? Uh, Mona, for example, generation. What's the most uh, attractive sure. element? Sure. So our commitment to our employer partners is that we are going to deliver high caliber talent that is going to be high productivity, that's going to achieve high quality outcomes, and that's also going to bring diversity to their workforce. Um, and whether it is about filling jobs where currently there's scarcity or whether it is about reducing uh, attrition issues at the, at the company, not only are we providing that pipeline, but we're also measuring with our employer partners that we're actually achieving those goals. And it's that evidence base and continuously demonstrating it now, you know, across 26 professions in 14 countries that um, that enables our employer partners to continue to be with us. Olivier, what's the most attractive element of your project to the companies? I think we at least have uh, exactly the same uh, element here. It's a very high pro um, instant productivity for the, for the companies who are in deep need uh, of uh, ICT professionals. I think that also companies do like students from 42 and alumni from 42 because of uh, this agile state of mind that our pedagogical model uh, try to uh, give and to develop among our students. Uh, they will be able to solve new kind of problems. They will be able to be pioneer, to think out of the box. And it's something that is very well appreciated for companies and they can uh, do some uh, innovation based on this uh, different point of views among their salaries, uh, employees, and uh, with our, uh, our own students. I think it's uh, definitely why uh, the companies like hiring uh, our students uh, after the, the curriculum. And Ricardo, what can you tell us about Banza? Well, I will say that our educational model is the, the best thing that, that we have. Uh, basically, what we do is measure the, the initial gap that the students have, then create new habits of learning, then combining the best things of offline education and online education, and then showing results to the, to the, to the company to see that training is a really good investment for them and their, their employees. Um how do you perceive in in this um, well in in this in this setting um, the combination between the traditional educational offer, for example, in universities, and the uh, educational offer that you are offering in your projects? And how do you uh, perceive the the consistence between both in the same uh, labor market? Uh, Olivier, for example. Do you have relationship well, with okay. universities? Actually, we don't have any kind of relationship with universities um, because they're very far from our pedagogical model. Uh, it's more private school in higher education who are way more interested in some kind of collaboration because they are already evolving and trying to adapt to uh, uh, develop the skills, the expected skills from the from the labor market. It looks like, at least in France, it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, I think that uh, anyway, we still need to have some diversity in education. Our pedagogical model is not suitable for everyone. Not everyone can succeed. Uh, and we are creating a 
different kind of elite, I would say. And uh, university should also be an uh, alternate path for other students that would like to also learn ICT, but maybe in a different way and with a different, uh, different approach. So I think that keeping this diversity in education is something that is still interesting. And for example, our students uh, are immediately uh, going to launch their career. And we do not have students who are going to do some uh, theoretical research, for example. And I think it's all, also something that uh, should be kept and uh, should not be completely uh, uh, put apart. And uh, so both uh, pedagogical models should, should exist and maybe uh, why not other and different uh, pedagogical model also should exist so everyone can find a suitable uh, learning path for, for him to uh, lead them to a, a successful career. Mona, in generation, what's this relationship? Do you have any relationship with universities or other uh, formal educational institution? Um, we do have formal relationships with technical vocational institutions. Um, so in many countries, um, the vast majority of those that are um, looking for workforce training are in vocational systems, but often the employment rates are much lower than the aspirations that the country or the system has. And so what we do is we, we work with these vocational institutions to embed our methodology um, in their classrooms and in their systems so that we can support them to increase um, employment rates and income gain for their learners. Um, what I'll say about universities more broadly, though, is that um, particularly in the wake of COVID and the mass unemployment that the world is now facing, people want jobs now. Um, and what that means is people are not going to be willing to invest in higher education unless they know that there is a job that is linked to it. And so increasingly, I would say higher education systems need to reflect on how to offer programs that take months as opposed to years um, and that actually deliver employment outcomes. And Ricardo, in Banza, do you have any relationship with uh, educational institutions or universities? We, we work with some educational institutions. Basically, we, we help them solve the soft skills gap that some of the students have. And I, I think regarding your question, we need a lot of vocational training, universities, boot camps, different solutions in education that obviously are related to employment, but that are related to change the informal economy of in our region of Latin America. Half of the economy in, in Latin America is informal. And most of the adults who work in this informal economy didn't even finish primary uh, education. So we need to create new, new educational models where people can, like in Germany, study, work, study, work, experience what it means to work, and, and then go back and study and, and create like new learning and career path, not only between vocational training and, and university, but also create like a career in, in, in become like a master's in, in something related uh, with vocational training education. And therefore we can change like the informal economy and, and increase the productivity and competitiveness of, of Latin America. So, for me, they're crucial for the, for the economy. Hmm. And just to finish, just a, a short, I want to ask you a short reflection about what's the impact of the pandemic, of the coronavirus, the, the crisis, on your project. Do you think your projects now are stronger than before the, the appearance of the, of the coronavirus? Um, Ricardo, we can start with you. Yes, our project now is stronger. What we learned is before the coronavirus, we used to do a lot of offline training. And, and after that, we decided to create this new blended model that it helped us expand really, really fast through different regions, not only in Colombia, but in Latin America. So it helped us a lot to improve our, our learning experience. 
and also to see which skills are relevant for the people to to improve their job performance. Um, so yeah, even though that companies are uh, reducing the the training budget, we kind of solve that through different uh, training solutions, and it helps us grow uh, this this year. Olivier, what's the impact of the COVID in 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 the school forty two? Well, um, it was helpful for us uh, because it revealed that our IT infrastructure um, was uh, already suitable for such kind of full online um, uh, situation. But it also revealed that uh, uh, actually half of our students were not ready yet. Uh, so uh, just right of out school, uh, newcomers, uh, it was more difficult for them to switch to a full, uh, full online. So uh, of course, with all the team, all the different campuses and the different situation in different countries, uh, we had a lot of talks about how we could uh, evolve our pedagogical model, our logistics to try to help and to bring all the students who could be a little bit lost uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the pandemic. So uh, we try just like we ask our students to develop an agile state of mind to face the future, to face new technologies. We also try to keep an agile state of mind uh, among our own staff to be able to always adapt and to always react uh, in front of such kind of uh, very unusual event. And Mona, now generation is stronger after the COVID? So in the wake of COVID, um, the population that, ne that is unemployed and needs support just grew dramatically across the world. And so we're certainly seeing um, high demand. Uh, two things I think we learned. Um, one is uh, we began experimenting with a set of online tools to support each of the seven steps of our methodology. Um, and that is certainly making us stronger as we do that. Um, and second, we also learned to use our assets in different ways. Um, so for example, one of the things we did was uh, our curriculum and instruction team. Uh, we, we worked with healthcare systems in multiple countries to create um, an online activity-based uh, COVID-19 training for healthcare workers. And so over about five months, we supported 250,000 healthcare workers um, to be trained in the skills to treat COVID-19 patients. So we've also learned how to use um, the assets of our institutions in different ways uh, than we had perhaps originally intended. So thank you. Thank you, three of us. It was a pleasure to share this time with you and to have the opportunity to know a little bit more about your, your project. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Olivier. And thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.